just settled into the mode of work, eat, sleep, and repeat? Or on a larger scale, you went to school so you could get a job, and you got a job so you could make money, and you made money so you could buy a house, so you could have a family, so you could raise kids who go to school to get a job, to make money, and buy a house. And life just starts feeling like a hamster wheel of activities that aren't really leading anywhere. Here at Grace, we believe that you were made for more. God didn't create you to live a mediocre life. Instead, he has given you gifts, skills, and passions that were meant to be explored and unleashed. We will help you discover the more that you were made for and see that God's plan for us includes dreaming big, finding your why, and starting small. It was a Sunday morning, uh, about an hour or so before noon. The facility I was in was modern. The thermostat was set just right. The restrooms were clean. I know because I checked them. Families are holding hands as they walk through the hallways. There's gentle music playing in the air. There's crowds of hundreds of people filling the building sitting together on benches or rows of chairs, and yet nobody is happy on this Sunday morning. The reason why is that I'm not describing a church. I'm describing an airport. In fact, a certain airport. It was the Philadelphia airport in December of 2013. Eight inches of snow had fallen in one hour. Hundreds of people were stranded there. It was one of the worst blizzards that they had had in years. And I was there. Now, do you imagine if what happened that morning, uh, the manager of the airport comes on the PA and says, it's so wonderful that you're all here. Please notice that there are screens available in many places to entertain you. We have uh, food in the various shops and really good coffee. Uh, people are starting to be friendlier than usual because you start talking to strangers if you're stuck in the same place long enough. They uh, might even say, the manager might say, do you know that there are actually 2,500 people here today? in the airport we counted them all and yet the planes are safely on the ground parked near the terminal and the problem with this picture and one reason why nobody's happy in this place on that particular Sunday morning a few years ago is because this is an airport and airports were not made as a place to hang out for a couple hours, to, a place to make some new friends, to catch some entertainment, maybe grab a snack. Airports were built for this purpose, to move people around the world to do their business or to get to their homes, back to their loved ones. Uh, airports are meant to send people out to experience an adventurous Vacation. <laughs> and when a place that's made for the purpose of connect, being a connector from one place, getting people from one place to another, becomes a destination, then that frustrates everybody. And I don't care if the place is called the city of brotherly love. <laughs> when, in, when a place like an airport a place, a connecting place, becomes a destination, then frustration ensues. Well, I spent the night there in that airport that night, along with a whole bunch of other people. It was the craziest, one of the craziest things I ever did. You know how careful you are in airports these days? You keep your eyes on your bag, you keep your eyes on your children, you keep your eyes on everything, you keep everything close, you're very, very careful. You know, you're watching people with a little bit of suspicion. I'm telling you, though, if you're stuck there overnight, you will lay down 
on a bench and sleep a foot and a half away from someone you've never met in your whole life. People there were, were buying up these, uh, I call them astronaut blankets. They look like a giant sheet made of aluminum foil. <laughs> they had those wrapped around them, you know. As you looked around, it looked like, it looked like giant baked potatoes everywhere you look. <laughs> All wrapped up. Well, the airport. As the airport is made for more than just a place to hang out and meet new people, the church is made for more, too. Now, I'm not talking about the building. I'm not talking about the facility. I'm talking about that we, as a people, are made for more. And that church, as Jesus designed it, was not meant to be a destination, but a connecting point for his mission throughout the world. A place to come together and gather, but also a place to be sent to many people in many places. In fact, the whole world. And you are a part of God's people this morning, and you are made for more. That's the title of this new series that we're doing, uh, doing now. It's called Made for More. And the emphasis is that the church and each of us as part of the church are made for more than what we have been taught, maybe, what we have been imagined, what we've experienced in our past. The church and those of us within it are made for more. We're going to be looking at, uh, this these weeks to come, we're looking at passages out of the book of Ephesians that was written by the Apostle Paul. Paul was called Saul, and then he met Jesus on a road, or the resurrected Jesus, and that changed everything for him. And he became... One who would write, he would start churches, and then he would go to another place and start churches. And, and to keep in touch with them, he wrote letters to them. And those letters have been gathered into the New Testament in our, in our Bibles. He started one church in a place called Ephesus. And later he wrote them a letter called Ephesians. And this is one of those letters where Paul gets really kind of of deep with, uh, with his understanding of what the church is meant to be. In fact, you would call Ephesians kind of like a constitution for the church. So we're going to look here at Ephesians chapter 1 today and find out several things that are made for more than what we might have imagined. So let's begin. First of all, I want to say that Jesus is more than just our Savior. We know that the story of Jesus, we know that he came um, the Son of God, born of a virgin, died on a cross, raised from the dead. We celebrated that last week. But did you know the rest of the story? Paul wants us to know the rest of the story, that Jesus, who has been raised, has now been exalted by God. Here's the way he describes it in Ephesians 1. He says, and now he, speaking of Christ, is exalted as first above every ruler, authority, government, and realm of power and existence. He is gloriously enthroned over every name that is ever praised, not only in this age, but in the age that is coming. And he alone is the leader and source of everything needed in the church. Did you hear that? He is the leader and the source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ. Literally, he has put everything under his feet. Everything under the feet of Jesus. You thought you had big feet. And he's given him the highest rank above all others. Paul wants us to know that Jesus wasn't just a historical figure. He was that. He really did live and he really did die. He really was raised from the dead. But he's not like we tell that story like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or Martin Luther King Jr. or various other figures in history. Jesus has been raised to a place beyond this world where he rules everything. Let me say it this way. This Jesus who forgave your sins is also Lord. The first confession of the early church, the church that was produced by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and by 
the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This Jesus, the first, the first confession of the early church was not, Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. We say that today. But the first confession of the church was, Jesus is Lord. And I know Lord has become for us kind of a religious term, like we think Lord means God. But really, Lord is a term of power, a term of authority. Because in the world in which the Ephesians lived, to say Jesus is Lord was taking, it was, it was a play on words, but a dangerous play on words. Because the confession of the Roman Empire was Caesar is Lord. And these Christians who had witnessed the, the, the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ had witnessed the fact that even though he died and was in a tomb and was raised from the dead, he had now entered into their fellowship through the Holy Spirit, and he is Lord, even over the Caesars of this world. We might say it this way, Jesus rules. Jesus is more than just our Savior. Notice four things in this passage that, that, that uh, God has done for his son. He raised him from the dead. And then he gives him the seat of authority. And literally, for a king, the seat of authority was at his right hand. And now we're told that Jesus is sitting at the right hand. He has been seated at the right hand of the Father. He puts everything in the universe under his feet, under his authority. And then he gives his son that universal power and authority, he gives his son to the church as the head of his body. You've heard the church referred to as the body of Christ, and we are all members of it. We're all part of the body of Christ. Every one of us is a part. You know, you might feel like a pinky or, you know. You feel, but you're part of this great body, and this body has a head, and that head is Jesus. But he's not just head of the church, he's head of everything. The Lord of all. So when we understand that Jesus is more than just our Lord and Savior, that he's the Lord of everything and everywhere and all things are accountable to him. And he has authority over all the universes. He has authority over everything, even the gods and the governments of this world. Jesus sits at the head of everything. That's very important to get that because we're, if we're going to be made for more, we have to understand that Jesus is more than just someone who has given us forgiveness of sins, as great as that is, who has made us a place in heaven. That's great. But he is ruling over everything in this world even now. Because of that, we can say the church's vision is more than just our idea. Uh, our pastor has been talking about uh, a one year, one year ago, well, actually in January, a year ago, we began this process of talking about what's for the future. We're asking Jesus, Lord, you only you know the future. We're not smart enough to figure this out. What's the future for our church? And some of you were on that vision team, and we, we prayed a lot, and we worked on it and all of that, trying to figure it out. Not trying to come up with something of our own mind, but trying to figure it out. Here's what we came up with, and you've heard Pastor Trent talk about these many times. The church's vision is for two things. The first is spiritual formation. Uh, what that means for us is that we are becoming more and more like Jesus, uh, both as individuals. You're becoming, as a person, as a follower of Jesus, he's shaping your life to be more like him. And corporately, as a body, Grace Church of the Nazarene is becoming more and more like Jesus to the community we represent him in. I pray that's true, and that's what we're aiming for. So spiritual formation is part of our future, our vision. The second part of our vision is geographic saturation. Now, what's that mean? <laughs> we want to be more than just a weekly meeting. We think God wants us to be more than just a weekly meeting on Sunday. We believe that God is shaping us to be a movement to fill our region with what we're calling points of grace, places where the church is represented in miniature throughout the week, wherever we go. 
And in those places, we represent Christ and his presence. We represent his church and the light of the gospel. And in a world that's dark, we want Christ through us to fill the world, our community, Marion County, if you will, to fill it with points of grace that are lighting up our community. So that Christ's influence through the church extends to fill our town, our county, and on and on. We think that's part of what Jesus said when he says, go into all the world and make disciples. That's part of what we're about. What I want us to see this morning through Ephesians 1, through Paul's words here, none of that's our idea. This is what Christ was about, always. This is what God was doing through Christ. In fact, Ephesians 1, 23, look at what it says here. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Are you, are you hearing me? We didn't come up with this. This is something that God planned through the ages of time, that he would fill the earth with representations of himself. It started in the garden when he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, subdue, and fill the earth. It started with a, a man named Abraham who he promised that although he had no children, that he would have a family and that that family would become a great nation and that he would pour blessings upon that nation and that through your seed, Abraham... All nations would be blessed. I will bless you so that you can spread blessing throughout the earth. And it started on a hill outside of Galilee where Jesus stood with his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. This has always been God's plan. And isn't it awesome that as we tried to discern God's vision, that he hooked us into something that he has been doing from the beginning. And we're part of that. You need to see that. This is not something we're smart enough to come up with. God is wanting us to live out the vision, his original vision that he gave us and fulfilled through Christ. Now, how is Christ planning to make that happen how does he intend to take his church and use it to use us to fill everything everywhere with his presence we have to begin to see that everything that we do as a church that's out there has an effect out there we can't just measure what we do based on what happens here in an hour or two on sunday morning we have to look at the effect that we're having out there so listen every grow group wherever it meets Every service project, every opportunity for service, everywhere that we meet, the church is represented. Christ is present. And by being there and meeting in his name and serving in his name and loving in his name, we will fill our geographic area with his presence. That's part of it. That's why we do what we do. And we're starting to measure differently. We see things as not here. We're, this is not the destination. It's out there. So we're starting to see that and, and count different and think about those things. But there's more than that. Because now I'm still talking about the church gathered in various places. There's more. And what's more goes from this. That, that Christ is more. The church is more. And a vision is more, but listen to me, until we understand that you are more, we'll never get there. And that's part of God's plan, is understanding what Christ has done for you. To understand that your salvation is far more than you ever imagined. It's not just a, your sins were forgiven. That's, that's praise God for that. <laughs> And it's not just that you get out a hell-free card. You know, it's not just that. It's not just that you get to go to heaven when you die. It has something to do with your relationship with this Christ who's far more than we can imagine. This Christ who is Lord over everything and his relationship to who you are. Ephesians 2 verses 6 through 9 says, 
For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. You know, that's what your baptism represents, by the way. That's why we bury you in the water and pull you back up. Because you're representing that you were raised with Christ. Not only did he raise you with Christ, he seated you with him in the heavenly realms. And because we are one, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. And so God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us through Christ Jesus. God saved you by his special favor, his grace, when you believe. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Now, you know that, right? It's what Christ did for us on that cross. It's what he did by, by being raised from the dead. And it's what he is still doing by his position of authority by the Father in heaven. And our uniting ourselves with him that's making the difference, not only for eternity, but in our world. You see, what Christ has in mind for us is this. Because he has done such an amazing thing in you through his salvation, through Christ who's raised, who is raised to his right hand, you are much more goer. Jesus did not say, I came that you might have church and church more abundantly. He didn't say that. He said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. And I'm here to tell you this morning and remind you that Having church is not going to change the world, people. It's just another religious thing. And the world's gotten pretty immune to the fact that we're having church. <laughs> I don't know. It happens every single week I talk to people about Jesus and their relationship with Jesus. And the thing that comes out of their mouth is, well, I used to go to church. And I say, wait, wait. I didn't even ask you that. I ask you about, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Is the fact that he died for your sins, is that real for you? The fact that he is risen from the dead and gives you a hope that not even death can take away, is that real for you? I'm not talking about where you go on Sunday morning. And if your salvation is no more than just where you go on Sunday morning, we're, we're far away from what he has for us. He has so much more. You see, we have a problem with multiple identities. On Sundays, we can be a churchgoer. This is where I go to church. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Nazarene. I'm Catholic. I am fill in the blank. On Mondays, though, we become, I'm a nurse. I'm a receptionist. I'm a factory worker. I'm a teacher. I'm a stay-at-home mom or dad. I'm a contractor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a corrections officer. I'm a business owner, you know. And then we have our online identity where we kind of, it's kind of become in my own little corner with my own little phone. I can be whatever I want to be, you know. So <laughs> we can make ourselves into whatever we create online is our identity. So we have multiple identities. Who we are as the church, though, is too oftentimes, if it's just being churchgoers, who we are in Christ and the church is left behind as we exit the church parking lot. And I have to say that we as pastors and staff are sometimes responsible to this because this is our job. <laughs> we live with this every single day, you know. And what happens inside the church can become so important to us and we can make it seem so important to you. And yet we understand that this time on Sunday morning can be some of the least influential parts of shaping your mission in your life. Christ made the church for more than just a meeting. He made it to be a movement. He made it more than just a destination. It is a connecting point where we are sent into all the world. And because so much of what the church does is based on weekly programs, we limit you to being volunteers to serve an hour per week on a program. If Christ means to fill our world with representations of his presence through the church, we have to begin to give more value than what we do when we're not in the pew. I just said that because it rhymes. We sit in chairs here, our famous blue chairs, right? We have to focus more upon what we do when we're not here. 
And that's why I say Sunday and your work week have to come together. Because you are more, even if, even if you're a serving, and we, we, you've got to serve, you've got to give your life, you've got to volunteer. But you are more than a volunteer. I don't stop volunteering. You need to volunteer. We can't do what we do on Sunday morning without you. But you're more than that. See, Ephesians 2, verse 10 says these words, and they're amazing. These are amazing words. For we, it's talking about you and me, we are God's masterpieces. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things, good things, he prepared in advance for us to do. It doesn't say... For we are the church's volunteers recruited to fill positions and programs as needed on Sunday morning. Oh, it's so much more than that. Thank you for doing that. Keep doing that. We need you to do that. But listen carefully to me. You are God's masterpiece. You are his handiwork. He was a carpenter, you know. We got lots of carpenters here today. You are his masterpiece, his handiwork. You're an example of his new creation that he began in Christ Jesus. And you being his masterpiece, he is sent out to do good things that he prepared in advance for you to do. You see why it's so important to know that Jesus has all authority, that he has the ability to be able to shape this world in time and in space, he can do, he can lead us because he has sent us out as his masterpieces to do the good things that he prepared in advance for us to do. So Christ has so much more for you to do, and he's prepared it all in advance. So what does it mean? What would it mean? And this is how this vision of filling Filling the space, filling the geographic area with representations of Jesus Christ. This is where this begins to, to happen. This is where this really begins to happen. Is when we realize that Christ has prepared good things in advance for us to do. Now, what does that look like? We have to start to think differently. We have to go into Monday differently. With a different mindset. We have to begin to see those things differently. Let me just tell you a quick story to get what this is about. And you remember, this is from the scriptures in, in Luke 22. It's the day of unleavened bread. It's the day before the Passover. They're getting ready to have the Passover. And Jesus tells uh, Peter and John, go and say, he says, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we can eat it together. And they say, well, where do you want us to do this? And listen to what Jesus says. He says, keep your eyes open as you enter the city. A man carrying a water jug will meet you. Are you getting the detail here? A man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him home. Then speak to the owner of the house. The teacher wants to know where is the guest room so that I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples. And he will show you a spacious second story room, swept and ready. Prepare the meal there. And they left and they found everything just as he told them. And there they prepared to pass over a meal. Are, are you getting what I'm trying to say here? Jesus tells his disciples, you go into town. I'm sending you. And there you'll see a man with a water jug. You're going to follow him. And he's going to take you to a room. And the room's going to be swept and ready. And pre I prepared all of this in advance. Jesus knew where everything was going to be so that they could have Passover together. All I'm trying to say here is he's prepared he, in the same way he has prepared good works, good things for you to do this week, tomorrow, throughout your life. He's working for you. Can I increase your faith this morning? Every one of us believes, and we always say this at funerals, we believe that Jesus promised his disciples I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I'll come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. 
And there's whole songs written about mansions in heaven, and Jesus has been working on that place for 2,000 years. And, and you have all the faith in the world that when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can be with me in eternity, you believe that, don't you? Shake your head. Yes. You believe that? You believe that he's prepared a place for you? Here's what. If the same Jesus who said, I go to prepare a place for you, Paul tells us this same Jesus who has all authority says, I have prepared. You're my masterpiece. I made you. <laughs> I have prepared good things for you to do in advance so that you can do them. You believe he's prepared a place for you in eternity in another world when this world's done. Do you believe he's prepared your next week? And he's prepared things for you to do in this next week that can make a difference in the world. Can make a difference in the things to come. That can make a difference in how many people in this geographic location get to know and experience Jesus this week that's how much more he has for you how do we live that way I don't know all the details about it but let me tell you where I think it starts two women Mary and Martha their sisters they invite Jesus over to the house and Martha goes to work in the kitchen pots are clanging and everything she looks in the living room, and there's Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. So she bangs some more pots together, you know, and tries to get Mary's attention because Martha is busy. Finally, she can't take it anymore, and she says, Lord, Mary won't help me. Would you tell her to help me do the work that I'm doing because I'm busy? And Jesus says, no, no, Martha. Mary's chosen what's best. And I'm not going to take it away from her. We, if we're going to do and be the more that Jesus wants us to be, then listen, it has to start by listening to him. You can't start your week or your day with talking about how busy you are. We've got to start by sitting still at the feet of Jesus, the one who is, has everything under his feet. We put ourselves in that position and we listen and say, Lord, I know you've already got this day planned. Don't let me miss it. Prepare me to say what you need me to say, to do what you need me to do, to do the good works. Thank you for making me your masterpiece. Thank you for raising me from the dead and putting me in relationship with you so that I'm even seated at the right hand of the Father with you. <laughs> Speak, Lord. I sit here like Mary and I listen for you to lead me into this day and into this week. That's how you get much, much more that Jesus has for you. Oh, you're a bunch of masterpieces this morning. And Jesus wants to lead us into living a different way. Here's what I want to do. I want us to be like Mary here for a couple minutes. We're just going to have some quiet music playing. And we're going to sit here for 